I'm Bill Hutchison. I'm a retired social studies teacher and administrator in the Capital School District here in Dover, Delaware. I've also been, since I'm in retirement, a volunteer with the Calmer Nickel Foundation, um, the square rigged tall ship that brought the first settlers to, to settle new Sweden here uh, where Wilmington, Delaware is. But I'd like to talk to you about another ship, the Mayflower. This month, 400 years ago, a group of Englishmen who referred to themselves as pilgrims landed on Cape Cod. Various historians describe them as intrepid, naive, gullible, foolish, or incredibly lucky survivors. Thanks to Thanksgiving dinner, their landing where they were not supposed to, and thereby drawing up a compact of self-government, and 35 million worldwide who claimed to be descendants these pilgrims became quite famous. This year marks the quadricentennial of the landing of the pilgrims at Plymouth. The COVID-19 pandemic has greatly curtailed, but not altogether halted, the commemoration of this historic event by the United States, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and the Wampanoag Nation. Much information can be found at Plymouth400inc.org. Most of the pictures you will see are of the Mayflower II, a replica built in England, sailed to America in 1957, restored at Mystic Seaport for the past several years at a cost of $11 million. Now it's safely back at Plymouth and open to visitors. I'm going to concentrate on the ship and its monumental voyage. I have long wondered if the pilgrims had not gotten lost but had actually sailed too far north on purpose, out of sight, out of mind. I'm still am not sure, so I'll just say the rest is history. There is actually almost no primary source material on the Mayflower in its sole voyage to America. No logbook not even a physical description or a builder's model of the ship. In the 17th century, the English built thousands of cargo ships. Samuel Pepys wrote at the time that shipwrights depended on their eyes, never pretending to lay down a draft, their knowledge lying in their hands so confusedly. William Bradford, an original pilgrim and the second governor, wrote the only account of the voyage, but did so years after the voyage when he published of Plymouth Plantation in 1651. Historians conjecture that the Mayflower was a three-masted ship, main mast with top mast, fore and top mast, mizzen and bowsprit. The ship was built sometime around 1606. Her length was 113 feet from the beak under the bowsprit to the stern taffrail, and around 20 feet of beam on the main deck. Her draft was 12 feet. Like most ships of the era, she probably had raised castles at bow and stern. She was rated at 180 tons, meaning that the hold could carry up to 180 large casks of wine. She sailed with six sails, five square sails, a main course, main top, four course, four top, a lanteen mizzen, and a square spritzel. She was steered by a whipstaff, a lever attached to the tiller, which ran to the rudder. The whipstaff rose vertically through a row, which allowed mechanical advantage to the helmsman, who steered the ship from under the poop deck. With only a wall and a binnacle or binnacle holding two compasses in front of him, directions were called down through a small grated hatch in the deck above where the person conning the ship stood. The Mayflower carried up to 10 gun cannons on the gun deck, which was below the main deck. Below the gun deck was the hold where the cargo was stored. It was on the gun deck, which measured 26 by 78 feet with less than five feet of height that 54 male passengers were housed for the voyage. The space, pro the space probably divided into small cabins by thin plank walls 
was shared with the guns, four parts of a shallop, a 10-ton sloop, chest of possessions, casts of food, chairs, pillows, rugs, and chamber pots. The captain relinquished the great cabin, which housed the married couples and unmarried girls. As a merchant vessel, she had been carrying cargo for 14 years before being hired by the pilgrims. She carried taffeta and satins from Germany, hats and hemp to Norway, wine and cognac from France. This last cargo left the hold and bilges smelling rather sweetly. Hence, she was known as a sweet ship. The only record of the ship after returning to England was in 1624, the Mayflower was valued at 128 pounds when she was supposedly beached and sold for scrap. Let's talk about the crew. The captain was Christopher Jones. He was 50 years old, married with two children. He owned a quarter interest in the ship. He'd been the captain of the Mayflower for 11 years. He would pass away in 1622, a year after returning. The first mate and pilot was Robert Coppin. He'd originally been hired to pilot the Speedwell and had sailed the coast of New England the previous year. Another pilot was John Clark, a veteran of two Atlantic crossings, including sailing to Jamestown. There were four quartermasters who would act as helmsmen, carpenter, cooks, gunners. Giles Heal was a barber surgeon. 20 to 30 able-bodied seamen who were paid 18 shillings a month. There was a cooper or barrel maker whose name was John Alden. The shallop crew consisted of Thomas English and John Ullerton and two seamen who were under contract to spend a year in the New World. There was another ship in our adventure. While the pilgrims were in Holland, they bought a Dutch pinnace of 40 tons, 50 feet in length, with three guns. It was to carry them to England and to accompany their expedition to America. Not being able to afford much, they purchased a ship that was in need of refitting. And Captain Reynolds was hired and set about re-rigging the ship. Larger masts and sails were stepped into the deck. So who were these pilgrims? The pilgrims were, according to historian Nathaniel Philbrick, a radical fringe of Puritans called separatists because they did not want to reform the Church of England, but to break away completely, which was a crime at the time. Thomas Fleming wrote in One Small Candle that they wanted to worship as their conscience directed them, but informers, sheriffs, constables, and bailiffs were under orders to harry them out of the land. Their first attempt at leaving England landed many in jail as the captain they hired took their money and turned them in. Their second attempt resulted in the separation of the men from their wives and children. As this captain sailed away, from approaching militia during the boarding process. The women and children arrived several months later in Holland. In 1608, they settled in Leiden, Holland, where their numbers grew to 400. During the intervening years, their religious haven crumbled. They became the victims of rock-throwing riots. A treaty with Spain was drawn, drawing to a close, which might mean a possible siege of the city. They were also fiercely English and hoped that establishing a colony in the New World would mean that they could raise their children as Englishmen. They were weavers, wool carters, tailors, shoemakers, and printers. No experience at colonizing or surviving in a wilderness. William Bradford later wrote in Of Plymouth Plantation, they, were, they knew they were pilgrims. They would be bucking the odds. 
Jamestown, established in 1607, had already lost 3,000 settlers out of 3,600. As late as 1619, a separate colonizing effort from Edom, Holland, sailed for Virginia, only to have 130 of 180 die of flux during the passage. The pilgrims were undeterred and put their faith in God. In Holland, the separatists took a vote on whether to leave or stay in Holland. Only 125 wanted to sail. The majority preferred to wait and see how the diehards fared. Robert Cushman and John Carver were sent to England to put their design into execution. The speedwell was purchased and made ready. Miles Standish, age 34, an ex-soldier, was hired to handle the plantation's defense. In London, Thomas Weston, representing a group of 70 investors called the Merchants and Venturers, had a patent with the Virginia Company for a settlement at the mouth of the Hudson River. The patent was a royal decree granting permission to establish a colony on a specified area claimed by the Crown in America. Investors would put up most of the money. In return, the pilgrims would collect and ship back beaver pelts and codfish. The first proposal presented in Holland was that the pilgrims would work four days for the company, two days for themselves, and the Sabbath was for prayer. At the end of seven years, the capital and profits would be divided among the shareholders and the pilgrims would own their houses. In May 1620, the Mayflower was docked at Riddiff on the Thames after unloading wine from France. Cushman and Carver met with Captain Jones to negotiate for the use of his ship in a business venture to the Americas. He was told that 70 London investors were putting up 7,000 pounds for a joint stock company. The planters would be sober, industrious Christians, now sojourning in Holland because they disliked the king's religious conformity and wished to stay out of his majesty's jails. A royal patent from the Virginia Company for a tract of land on the American coast was held by the company. Jones agreed to a fee of 400 pounds for the use of his ship. Jones hired a crew and sailed for Southampton. In July, the Speedwell with most of the pilgrims arrived at Southampton after a harrowing crossing of the English Channel. The ship's hull had sprung, causing planking to leak like a sieve. Docked next to the Mayflower, the Speedwell needed recalking. The arriving pilgrims discovered that their representative, Robert Cushman, had been forced to agree to new terms on the contract with their investors. Weston had had to renegotiate or lose the investors. Six days would now belong to the company and the homes they built would stay with the company. They also found out that they would be sharing their voyage and the plantation with non-separatists. The investors had sold passage to strangers. When the pilgrims protested at the unfair terms and the new fellow settlers, they found themselves unable to even quit the venture as they were out of money and already 60 pounds in debt. They had no choice but to accept. The provisioning of the ship had been a fiasco from the start. Christopher Martin, designated as the head of the non-pilgrims, spent 700 pounds on supplies before the arrival of the Speedwell. He refused to account for his purchases. Cushman and Carver also brought supplies, beer, wine, hardtack, salted beef and pork, dried peas, fishing supplies, muskets, armor, clothing, tools, trade goods, and a screw jack for house raising. Barrels of salt beef, cod, beer, water, biscuits, along with sacks of smoked beef, tubs of pickled eggs, and boxes of smoked herring were all stowed below. Two tons of butter, that's barrels, had to be sold to pay off their debt in order to even get off the dock. Checking their provisions, they discovered they were short on oil, leather for making shoes, muskets, and armor. But it would be several months before they would realize how tragically short they were 
on vital foodstuffs and beer. On August 15, 1620, the Mayflower with 90 passengers and the Speedwell with 30 departed Southampton. They were already two months behind schedule. Late spring was considered the best sailing weather, leaving summer to explore and build shelters and clear land. Once in the English Channel, the wind was against them. The Speedwell began to founder. Pumps had to be manned constantly. The ships hoped to, shouted across the predicament, and turned around, limping back to Dartmouth. After a week of repairing, retrimming sails, and recalking, the two ships put to sea again. But only 300 miles at sea past Land's End, the Speedwell's pumps were again being overwhelmed. With water pouring in as the hull flexed with each ocean swell, once again the ships hove to, and the Speedwell's captain declared his ship was so leaky as he must bear up or sink in the sea. The ships turned around and sailed this time to Plymouth, England. Here it was determined that the Speedwell was unseaworthy and had to be abandoned. Some speculated that Captain Reynolds had purposely overrigged the, ships, the ship, causing her planking to buckle from the strain of too much canvas aloft. He might have wished to get out of the contract with the pilgrims. Captain Jones was confident that the Mayflower could go it alone, though it was not common practice for colonizing expeditions to consist of a lone ship. Supplies and passengers were transferred from the other ship. 20 passengers had to be left ashore, including Robert Cushman and his family. Only 50 separatists remained of the 102 passengers. It was now September 6th. Almost all the provisions taken aboard for the voyage itself had already been consumed. They were now down to eating the food that was supposed to sustain them for the coming winter in an alien new land. The Mayflower departed in a fine small gale blowing east by northeast, allowing her to make six to seven knots, but putting all the passengers out of sorts with seasickness. Imagine 102 sick passengers, including 34 children, confined below decks with only buckets for sanitation. Bradford, in his book, only wrote a few paragraphs about the two-month voyage. The passage was extremely stormy, with the ship having several times to lie a hull, sails furled, whipstaff lashed down holding the ship to leeward. Captain Jones chose to sail along the 42nd parallel, despite contrary winds and bucking the Gulf Stream. He shot the sun with a cross staff to determine his latitude. But in 1620, there was no way to determine longitude. To measure speed, a log line was used, counting knots in a line thrown overboard to determine how many nautical miles per hour the ship had covered. The sailors began to make fun of the ill passengers, calling them gib gabberty puke stockings, they also took pleasure in shouting profanities. The worst offender died quite suddenly two weeks into the voyage, which caused a highly superstitious crew to back off. During one particularly violent storm, the main beam cracked and buckled and could not be forced back into place by six men. The pilgrims had brought a great iron screw from Holland over house raising. It was used to force the beam straight, and a supporting beam was wedged underneath. For most of the 13 weeks, the 102 passengers were confined to below decks in darkness. No change of clothing, no bathing, food becoming more deplorable by the day. Everyone was damped and chilled from the seawater slashing and dripping through the deck. One passenger, John Hallen, did venture on deck and was washed overboard. He was able to grab a line and was hauled back aboard. He later progenerated 10 children and 88 grandchildren, and his descendants today include the former president of the United States, George Bush. The ship's galley was primarily used to feed the crew and officers, 40 men. Passengers mostly ate cold pickled beef, pork, and fish 
served with biscuits made from wheat flour and dried pea flour, called hardtack. A very small hearth box filled with sand was the only place a fire could be built to cook a small portion of food. Pea soup with bits of meat was the usual hot food and provided the only liquid to soften the incredibly hard biscuits. Hardtack was an extremely apt name. The only sweets were burgoo, oatmeal sweetened with molasses or doughboys, wet flour dumplings, or plum duff, suet pudding containing raisins or prunes. Beer was the only beverage. The crew was rationed to one quart a day, passengers about the same. Water barrels had fouled quickly. 10 weeks in, they were down to their last keg of beer and out of firewood. Elizabeth Hopkins went into labor during the voyage, giving birth to a boy who was named Oceanus. William Bitten, 22, took sick and died, as did a sailor. Scurvy was appearing with bleeding gums, loose teeth, foul breath, and even death. At 7 a.m. on November 9th, land was sighted. They were 65 days out of Plymouth, 97 days from Southampton, having averaged around two miles per hour. The captain estimated that they were off of Cape Cod, which put them north of the territory of the Virginia Company. Their patent did not extend above the 41st latitude. They had been offered back in England a patent for a newly formed company, the Council of New England, but they had decided at that time not to wait for its approval from the royal court. Captain Jones estimated they were 60 miles too far north. Since fishing was one of the occupations which the pilgrims were supposed to toil to fulfill their agreement, Cape Cod was considered. In spring, hundreds of ships from Europe were replying these waters fishing. A decision was made to try and sail south. With the wind out of the north, the captain turned south for the Hudson Valley. Charts of this area were unreliable. Shoals and reefs abounded. The crew made use of two sounding lines, a heavy one with 600 feet of line and a smaller lead line with 120 feet of line. The ship probably sailed along the edge where the bottom dropped off from 120 feet to 300 feet. They sailed for five hours on an easy reach. Early in the afternoon, the wind died and the water shallowed. They were now in what had been called Tucker's Revenge by an earlier ship and would later become known as Polak's Rip, a 15 mile maze of shoals and sandbars beginning off the elbow of Cape Cod. Bradford noted, they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers. Thankfully, the wind began to shift in the late afternoon and Jones was able to come about and sail clear of the shoals before dark. The Hudson was no longer an option. The ship hove to for the night, main sails aback, Four sail on the opposite tack, the ship drifted with the tide, an utterly black coastline to the west. The strangers and the pilgrims argued through the night. It was realized that some sort of compact or agreement was needed to bind everyone together if this venture was to succeed. The drafting of the agreement was inspired by their pastor in Holland, John Robinson's farewell letter. He advised them to quote, become a body politic using among yourselves civil government, end quote. Would their landing outside the patent they had been granted mean the servants were no longer under obligation to their masters? Did the agreement they had signed with the financiers back in London, which obligated them to six days of toil and even ownership of their houses, which they would build, would it become invalid? The next day, the ship surged north under all five sails, including bonnets on the courses. By nightfall, they were off the northern tip of the Cape. The ship hove to again. William Brewster and Stephen Hopkins had drawn up a compact as the ship made its way around the Cape. The next morning, November 11th, 1620, sunrise was at 6.55. The passengers assembled in the captain's cabin. 41 men signed what would become known as the Mayflower Compact. Nine men did not sign. John Carver was also chosen as governor for one year. His term would end in April of 1621 when he collapsed and died while working in the fields. Bradford succeeded him. 
At the same time, Captain Jones was guiding his ship into the harbor at what is today Providence Town. Jones noted that the harbor was large enough to accommodate a thousand ships. He had the anchor dropped off Long Point at 10 a.m. They were now anchored off a low sandy point of land. Bradford wrote, quote, a hideous and desolate wilderness, end quote. Going ashore posed problems. The 35-foot shallops they brought in four pieces was in poor shape from the voyage. It would take days to put it together and make it seaworthy. Only the smaller ship's boat was usable to ferry people and supplies to the shore over a mile away. Sixteen men armed with muskets and axes were sent ashore in the longboat. Grounding on a sandbar, they had to wade through three feet of water to reach land. Exploring inland, they found a narrow neck of land bounded on the other side by ocean. They found a forest of oaks, pines, juniper, birch, holly, ash, and walnut. No water or natives were sighted. Bradford later wrote, quote, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their foot on the firm and stable earth, their proper element." End quote. They cut fresh, fragrant cedar wood for firewood and returned to the ship before nightfall. Everyone on board enjoyed a hot meal and the warmth of the blazing fire for the first time in weeks. Several explorations of the land convinced the pilgrims that Cape Cod was not suitable as the site for a permanent colony. They had found little fresh water, uncovered a stash of native corn, and encountered only a small party of Indians who ran away. Once the shallop was made seaworthy, Captain Jones led an expedition along the shoreline around the bay where they discovered another harbor, which they named Plymouth. Whether they stepped ashore on a huge boulder is only conjecture, as no mention was made of the Plymouth Rock until the 18th century. The location boasted a large protective harbor, a hill to mount a battery of cannon for defense, and many plots of already cleared land for farming. The shallop sailed across the bay to the Mayflower, which followed back to their new home. 50 of the 102 colonists did not survive that first winter. Likely no one would have survived if it had not been for the arrival of Squanto, a local Patuxet Indian who had been taken into bondage by an English captain, sold in Spain, but eventually made his way to England where he learned to speak English. Arriving back home, he discovered that his entire tribe had succumbed to a plague. The Mayflower departed Plymouth on April 5, 1621 with no cargo, only 10 sailors and barely enough food to see the depleted crew back to England. The winds though were favorable and the ship made it to England in a month. This ends the tale of the Mayflower. She suffered an ignoble end as salvage. The story of the pilgrims continued. After facing that hard winter, they formed an alliance with the Wapanoags, led by Massasoit, working hard to maintain peaceful relations. Unfortunately, the area they settled in had been decimated by disease to the point where some tribes had been totally wiped out by contact with Europeans carrying diseases to which the natives had no immunity. In 1675, King Philip War started by Metacom, the son of Massanoet, the native Sachem who had befriended the pilgrims, led to the almost total annihilation of many local tribes and thousands of colonists. Percentage of death-wise, it was the bloodiest war ever fought on American soil. I hope I have piqued some interest in the Plymouth colonists and that you will delve into their history after this first Mayflower landing, including the first Thanksgiving in November of 1621. Their relationship with the Native Americans, their obligation to their investors back in England, the influx of new settlers by ship, and their eventual merging with the Massachusetts colony is fascinating history.